Joe, you've lived through the war and experienced hardships and loss. Do you have any advice for other people to help them through the difficult times in life? Yes, I sure do. I, I, um, your, your, your friends uh, should be, if you have friends and, um, and family, you know, you should never be left alone. You know, show, show them that they're there for you and, and get your life together. Um, I had uh, uh, Rotary Club has been um, a great thing, you know, a service club. And then um, when um, I had services for my wife, this father Kevin from Holy Angel was unbelievable. And uh, as of today, he's still there for me, uh, always looking after him for me. And and. Um, He's uh, proud of the, as, as a serviceman and the things I've done, you know, and, and he's there for me. And so that's a big thing is, is your friends and uh, church people has been very great. My family has been really great. You need them all. You can't be left alone. If you're not even left alone, I mean, it, it's, a, it's sad. And um, um, I, there's other things you, you got to help yourself out, too. You can't just depend on anybody to make it. you got to help yourself out. And you got to get out there too, and, and, and be yourself, and, and and not just sit there and moan and cry or whatever it is, because I don't think your your loved one would like to see that that you know you're sitting there doing nothing, you know. And so I continued, I continued to do the things that um, I had a, 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 a I had paid, I had a little job with um, Wondrous Ford, you know. I knew the, the young man that owned it, you know, and so he gave me a little job to visit the insurance companies and stuff like that for, for him, you know, and I did that and I enjoyed that. They kept me busy. They kept me busy. You got to get, you got to keep going. Don't, don't, don't just stand back and do nothing. And so that's the best I can tell you. There's one more thing I have to tell you that I thought um, it was very scary, you know, um, at the fact that um, at one time, we were, I was in a bombardment where we were getting shells all around us and everything, you know. And when the shells started hitting, I hit the ground and I hit my front teeth. I did not come out, but I loosened my four front teeth. So uh, they, they, I was picked up and taken down below uh, to a dentist to, to get that worked out and keep them going for a while. So. Um, now, on the same day, they, uh, when I was coming down, uh, were the Jeep picked me up, up in the uh, ridges, you know. Then we had to come down. As I was coming down, I was being fired at by the Japanese. I was just, you know, going down there. I, I, had, I should have stayed there where I was at, and I was better off. But I made it down there. They did fix them. So that when they brought me back, they left me off on one ridge, and my other ridge was further out. So I had a go down one ridge and up another ridge to get to my outfit. So at nighttime, you can't move around. Anything that moves, you're, good at, you're dead. So I had so much time to get to my company, or my boys out there, before it got dark. So I, as I went down one ridge and up the other, and to, I got there on time. That evening, we had a lot of activity. Japanese were trying to get through us, you know, and so a lot of firing and we had a lot of grenades going on. And so the next morning we went down a ridge and we had, you know, when I was walking off the trail, the Japanese were right below me in caves as I was walking up alone. And I didn't know that until the next day where I would have been in real trouble if they saw me coming up there and I would be completely gone. But we had to take them and we, uh, and, and, and cave in their caves and get them out. Uh, we couldn't get them out any other way because every time we throw in there, they throw out. And so we had to use a, what they call Bangalore torpedoes and cave in the, the cave. So that was one incident that was, I didn't realize it until afterwards. I scared afterwards before I didn't know about it. And that I thought I'd tell you about. That was a very bad experience. Next. Um, well, is there anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, there's a lot of things uh, I'd like to share. Uh, after um, after the, uh, the we took over the uh, 
the ridges. We took over um, uh, 47 ridges, and um, and uh, we, we were able to clear Belletti Pass. And we called it the uh, Colonel Dalton Pass because Colonel Dalton was the only colonel that fighting along with the men, and he got killed. So we named it after his name. And uh, so now, after that, um, uh, the war was still on. So uh, we start we start getting replacements for a lot of men that that we lost, and we start training these replacements for ready to get invade Japan, and. Um, so during the time we were training all these young men, um, we we didn't we didn't know about the dropping of the atomic bombs two or three days afterwards. But we don't get the news that the war was over, you know. So uh, then we did get the news. We know what was happening. So now uh, our our outfit was twenty uh, fifth infantry division was asked to board these Liberty ships, you know, and go to Japan uh, to occupy Japan. So as we were going, we hit the most dangerous typhoon ever in the history in the China Sea. And uh, a lot of the ships, we had as a convoy, and a lot of the ships were just ready to spit in too, were so bad. And I was, uh, as a platoon sergeant, I guess I was the youngest platoon sergeant now in the United States Army, uh, I was in charge of the deck for whatever reason that was my job and so uh, uh, so um, it took us 30 days to get to, to Japan normally it would take four but the time that the, we had swells of water uh, could be about about eight ten stories high I mean that, and that's how bad it was um, so as we got to uh, Japan, we uh, I think we hit one island before we went. Um, we got to the mainland, and um, then we hit uh, Kyoto. Then we hit the Strait of Kyoto. Um, and as we were going in, we we went very slowly because we didn't know on both sides because it was all a narrow. Car. We didn't know whether they were getting any fire on us, or so we were ready for whatever. So we got to Kyoto, and um, Kyoto, and then uh, from there we went to um, we were stationed in this here uh, Jfu. Um, it's a air base. That's where we stationed, and my platoon was in charge of destroying all the weaponry. Um, you. It was amazing, but the, the, the thing that I, I would like to say about that when we landed in Japan, and the Japanese that we met treated us very nicely. We couldn't understand it. Uh, they, they were well accepted, um, well accepted by them, and because um, um, we marched through the um, to the little town there, and um, it was a lot of areas. It was not like a lot of uh, open ground where we were at, and. Uh, so anyway, that's um, uh, the Japan deal, and um, so then a couple other items in here to say that I would like to talk about, um, and one of them uh, this goes back to um, this goes back to um, uh, the the war, and and uh, no one has ever talked about World War II women. I don't think you've ever heard about. Without the women, and they should be talking about it, without the women that were left behind, if it wasn't for them, we could have never won the war in Europe because their supplies and their hard work, I don't know if you heard of uh, Rosie, the, 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 the um, what they call that, she was working on the ship. Um, oh, the Riveter. Visit, Riveter. Riveter. Rosie the Riveter. You ever heard of Rosie the Riveter? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of women like that, and without them, we could not, they supplied us with the food and everything that was needed, clothing, we never, but no one ever mentioned them. They were part of the war, just as I am, and I was, and many more like me, you know. So um, that was um, um, something I thought I would like to mention, and um, so, um, uh,
anyway, I I, uh, I mentioned all the islands I had. Um, I was I was in about seven or eight different islands in the Pacific, and I <clears throat> actually I made a complete circle of the Pacific. It could be like four, fifty-four thousand miles or so. Like um, I started out from um, San Francisco and went all around to the Philippines, Japan, and um, all around back to Oahu, uh, coming in, and um, and ended up in Seattle. So I just actually made a complete circle of the whole uh, Pacific. And uh, <clears throat> I think of our, I have a lot of literature on uh, my platoon and the one we lost and um, young men we lost. And I think about all the servicemen today, I think that People should be thankful that these people are, are agreeing to to be there and fight for our freedom. And yet we have so much trouble here going on right now and a lot of changes that is hurting us very badly. And these guys are out there giving their life to try to keep what we have. I think that something's got to be done. These boys should not be there if they, if they can't appreciate what they're doing. And uh, there's so many things I could talk about. I wish I could think of it. When I leave here, I'll probably think all the things I liked, I would like to say, and I didn't remember. You know, uh, I love this country just like most people do. And uh, I felt I've, I've done everything I could to support it in any way. Um, like many other, like I say, when I say me, I, I talk for all our veterans. Now, there's one thing I think is very sad. We have American Legion. American Legion is a big organization, you know. And um, what I don't understand, there's 25 million veterans, and I think they've got to get out and speak out. But they're, they're, I know they they do an awful lot. The American Legion they help a lot of veterans out. But you got to get out and speak up and tell them, find, tell these people what's happening, and not be quiet. I mean, you got to speak up now. If you love the country you fought for, I mean, get out there and do something about it. And say, hey, this is a loving country, democracy. Look at, look what's happening with these little kids in school. That should never happen. We got all over the country. I mean, we have people are going in different directions, and it can't be. When I was in the service, I didn't know anything. Of, I knew that growing up was always a Democratic Party, you know, and I knew nothing else. And I just support whatever this country wants. So, and then uh, many years that we had the Democrats and Republicans, you know, party, and I, then a lot of them got along. I mean, a lot of them disagree with each other, but they got along very nicely. And there's a few Democratic people I really admired, you know, that were very brilliant, you know. Um, and and yet today, these guys are, are clowning today, which is never should be. You should be working together. You can have your own opinion, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll appreciate what your, your opinion is. You know, if you're right, then I'll go along with it. If you think I'm right, then you go along for it. But it's not happening. It's very bad for our country. And I wish that people would understand that. Understand that because they were in trouble if not. Um, those are all my questions, Joe. Thank you for sharing your memories and for your sacrifice and service. I, 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 you know what? I appreciate you asking me. I just want to, if I could just say the words and tell the people exactly how I feel. And when I speak, I speak for all veterans, not just for me. Because whatever I went through, 16 million other veterans have done the same. And so I think, and I want to appreciate that. I thank you. I thank you, Yvonne. I think this is how I want to thank our little gal, uh, Elizabeth, too, uh, for bringing me here. I want, I, I want to talk to people. I want to talk to young people. And, um, Adults too, whatever you know, whatever it is, and tell them what how I feel, because I love this country. I love this country. I love every. Our life has been beautiful up until now.